I would like to tell you a history story. One that is not written in the history books, nor is it being taught in the classrooms. But I think you will agree that it should be. It was long, long ago, in the days of our ancestors, there lived a man named Dagonawita, an Oneida holy man. And at that time, there were five nations living in the area. They were the Seneca, the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Oneida. And these nations were always fighting with each other. Many wars were being fought. Many lives were being lost. This greatly troubled Dagonawida, and he thought, there must be a way to devise a system by which these nations could live together in peace, a secure and lasting peace. He thought and thought about this until he hit upon a plan, one he called the Great Plan of Peace. Then he began to travel among these nations, speaking with the people, sitting in council explaining his plan, forging alliances. The alliance was such that each tribe would maintain control over their own affairs, but they would come under a much larger treaty, one that stated, should anyone attack any one of these tribes, they would be attacking all of them. All major decisions would be made by the five nations sitting in council. The day-to-day -day decisions would be left to the individual tribes. And it was the women who would elect the men to council. This was part of the rule. And if the men did not do the job, the women would vote them out. And so these five nations came together and met at a place not far from what is today Syracuse, New York. And at that first meeting, over 50 chiefs gathered under a symbolic tree of peace and declared, this is our alliance, and it is good. They became known as the Iroquois Confederacy, but they called themselves the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. Now, many years later, Benjamin Franklin had heard of this alliance. And at that time, the colonies were looking for a system by which they could work together. The problem was that each one of the colonies wanted to be in charge. But they knew they would have to come together to protect themselves from England. So in 1765, they met at the New Albany Convention, and Benjamin Franklin invited the Iroquois people to come to this convention to explain how their system worked. And they did. And the colonial representatives liked this system. And so that great plan of peace that Dagonawida started and brought democracy to this land 300 years before Columbus became the foundation for what is today the Constitution of the United States of America. In 1987, Senator Daniel Inouye brought this before the combined houses of Congress, and it is now written in the Congressional Record that this is the truth. The Constitution of the United States came from the Haudenosaunee people. This nation was founded on Indian principles. <laughs>
As we leave the longhouse through the western door, we are reminded of the Seneca's role in the Iroquois Confederacy. As keepers of the western door, visitors coming from the west who wanted to travel through Haudenosaunee territory had to be welcomed by the Seneca. In many ways, the longhouse was both a place to live and a symbol of peace. The Iroquois is actually a group of six different Indian nations. In the late 1500s, the Seneca, Mohawk, Cayuga, Oneida, and Onondaga nations joined together to form the Iroquois Confederacy, ending warfare between these nations. Then, in 1772, a sixth nation, the Tuscarora, moved into the region and joined the Iroquois Confederacy. Although the different nations lived in separate regions, the people of the Iroquois Confederacy thought of the land they shared as one giant longhouse. And just as families work together in a longhouse, the different nations also work together. The Senecas, who lived in the western end of the territory, were the keepers of the western door. The Mohawks, who lived in the eastern end, were the keepers of the eastern door. And the Onondagas were the keepers of the Central Council fire. After the Europeans arrived in New York in the 1700s, the Iroquois way of life was changed forever. Most of their land was taken by the Europeans after the French and Indian War, and then the colonists after the American Revolution. And they no longer lived in longhouses as their ancestors had for hundreds of years. Instead, they lived in log cabins similar to the European settlers. Today, thousands of Native Americans still live in New York, in towns and cities, and on reservations. And Native American names are still used throughout the state. Oneida, Cayuga, Tonawanda, Onondaga, Lake Erie, and Seneca Falls, to name a few. To the Iroquois people, the Longhouse has remained a powerful symbol of their culture, uniting them no matter where they live. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, or the Haudenosaunee, I mean the people who are building a longhouse, the people that completed a house. That longhouse really is a symbol of the actual building that we used to live in, but it's also a metaphor for our way of life. And it also is a symbol of how we govern ourselves. Five nations, five extended families living under one roof. That roof is the common law, we call the great law. So the Longhouse then became kind of the touchstone for uh, all the Iroquois. This was the basic unit of their society. And so it was natural for them to seize upon that as the metaphor for the League of the Iroquois. So they imagined then that there was a great invisible Longhouse that stretched across uh, New York State from near what is now Albany to near what is now Rochester through the Finger Lakes area, with the ends of the Longhouse being uh, occupied conceptually by the Mohawks at the east end, the Senecas at the west, the Onondagas at the middle, and uh, the other two uh, nations of the League of the Iroquois, the Oneida and the Cayuga being between them. So it's, uh, it's an interesting metaphor that they came up with that was based in their domestic architecture. We start off with this lodge where the families are together and slowly as the families grow, as other nations join us, the longhouse keeps extending. And ideally it extends from where the sun rises in the east to where it sets in the west. So it really is the symbol that through peace we will become united and strong. One translation from the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in 1616 describes an Iroquois longhouse. Their cabins are in the shape of tunnels or arbors and are covered with the bark of trees. They are from 25 to 30 fathoms long and 6 fathoms wide, having a passageway through the middle from 10 to 12 feet wide. On the sides, there's a kind of bench 4 feet high, where they sleep in the summer in order to prevent the annoyance of fleas, of which there are great numbers. <laughs> 
In the winter, they sleep on the ground on mats near the fire, so as to be warmer than they would be on the platform. They have pieces of wood suspended on which they put their clothes, provisions, and other things for fear of mice. In one of these houses, there may be twelve fires and twenty-four families. It smokes excessively. There is no window, nor any other opening except in the upper part of their cabins, for the smoke to escape. It would typically be uh, a house that would have a series of compartments, and somewhere in that house there would be a senior female and her husband. And the other compartments were occupied by that woman's daughters, maybe her sisters, maybe her granddaughters, and the various men that had married into the family who had moved to this longhouse from other longhouses. You know, one thing about Haudenosaunee village is everybody had a role to play and very important roles. There was a balanced society. The men had work to do. The women had important work to do. In fact, the women were probably more uh, involved in orchestrating the economy of the village because they're out doing uh, the planting and the crops, or make, producing the clothes, and producing the kitchenware and all of the utensils. The men are out in the woods uh, gathering raw materials, hunting, fishing, trapping. The best way to look at it is the, the domain of the men is out in the woods. The domain of the women is within the clearing where the village and the fields are. Now, the old people, or we would call elders, they also are the mentors for the young kids. They're there to teach them the finer details about things. But what we believe is that everybody's born with a certain gift. You have one, I have one, everybody has one. As soon as that gift becomes revealed, then you have to master that gift for the sake of the community. It's like you learn how to make a pot, but you're also hearing the stories about clay you know, and how the first pot was made and what the designs mean. So as you're making these things, you're learning about the larger history. And that's where the old people would come in and tell you that history. Iroquois women presided over all of the cultivation, along with help from the youngsters. The method of growing the crops involved uh, uh, girdling the trees and letting the sun come into the forest during the heat of the summer. But the planting was uh, a fairly easy task of simply using simple hoes to scrape up the soil of the forest, which is pretty loose. Forest stuff is, is easy to work with. Scrape that up into hills, and those small hills were then uh, planted with sometimes all three, but sometimes just one or two of their main crops. So certainly they'd put some corn kernels in the hill. They might put in some beans, and they might put in some squash. Now these three plants worked together in a beautiful sort of way, not just um, nutritionally later on after they were harvested, but also while they were growing. The beans could use the corn stalks like bean poles. So the corn stalks provide support for not just the corn uh, itself, but also for the beans that are twining up the corn stalk. At the same time, the squash spread out on the, um, on the ground between the hills and shaded the ground and, and suppressed other weeds that otherwise would have competed with the plants. So they've got all three of these things growing together. Around the age of 10, the boys would begin traveling with their fathers instead of staying to help closer to the village with their mothers. These young men were extremely excited to be able to go on long hunting and fishing expeditions that might last for many days at a time. The old longhouse lifestyle was, uh, was very hard. Uh, had to do a lot of work, but at the same time, we had a lot of ways for the people to entertain themselves. Uh, one of them was lacrosse. Now, we believe lacrosse started right at the time of creation. Uh, the two creator twins that were were wrestling for who's going to have domain over this land, played lacrosse, and they played to a draw. So when we play lacrosse today, it's like we are reenacting that kind of great celestial battle for the domain. And uh, we also believe that uh, our ancestors pass and go back up to the sky world, that they play lacrosse up there. It's the creator's favorite game. He just loves to see us uh, play. And it was a way for the men to, uh, you know, kind of exercise themselves, relieve a lot of stress, and, and um, like promote a friendly rivalry, we'll say. They spent a lot of time uh, engaged in uh, ritual activity that was designed to reinforce the, the community. So you've got the Strawberry Festival. In the spring you've got um, um, uh, the Thunderers, which is uh, to welcome the thunderstorms of the spring, the green corn uh, ceremony in, say, August, and then the uh, harvest ceremony in the fall. And over and over again, what happens in these cyclical kinds of ceremonies?
uh, is that there's a, a great deal of, uh, of attention paid to the Thanksgiving address. The whole purpose of the Thanksgiving address is to recognize the indebtedness of human beings to the resources that are provided by nature. The Iroquois were very thankful for what the Creator had given them. They were also incredibly resourceful, finding uses for the hide, such as clothing and bedding, as well as endless uses for bones and antlers. They were smart about how they went out into the environment. They dressed warmly as they could. They would stuff their moccasins with uh, moss in order to give them some insulation. They wore leggings, uh, and they wore long cape-like uh, cloaks of uh, beaver uh, pelts stitched together. Those are pretty warm. Um, but nonetheless, if you're going to avoid frostbite, uh, if you don't want to lose fingers uh, in the bitter cold of the depth of winter, then you just stay inside uh, until it blows over. Now that can be pretty rough if uh, you have an extended period of snowfall and cold weather. Uh, you might find yourself starving uh, and the choice then is to either go out, try to find a deer, or to stay inside and starve to death. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a hard choice uh, for folks in this environment in the middle of the winter. It was a time when they would uh, be making a lot of their tools, getting ready for the summer, uh, carving things. Uh, a lot of artistic expression is the consequence of having time on your hands. men would come back to the village, and that's the time where stories are told, that winter. And primarily because they said, if you tell the stories in the spring and the summer, uh, they're such great stories that all the animals get kind of lazy, and they gather around and listen to these stories, and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. First of all, you know how drab the winters are here. You need these animated stories to enliven your spirit. So that's the time when you learn about what's going to happen. So it would be great storytelling time. The storyteller would come by and Usually they would carry this little bag full of goodies, you know, and they'd reach in the bag and pull out something, maybe pull out a bear tooth. He says, oh, this tooth reminds me of this great monster bear. I'm going to tell you about them. And the storyteller is kind of an animator. He brings that story alive. And so um, that was the way in which our people taught each other. The other thing, too, is you can imagine then um, our world or our comprehension of the world uh, was uh, gained through these stories. That's how we learned who we are and where we belong. Today, television has invaded our homes and our kids are hearing everybody else's stories but ours, so it's no wonder that we're a little confused these days. I think because um, and originally um, the, the, the truth is that the Constitution does come from the Iroquois Confederacy. It does come, and the U.S. Congress acknowledged that not long ago, mm -hmm. that it does indeed influence by the, the and you find out uh, uh, Franklin and Jefferson did go and spend at least 30 years before and learned the, the, the Mohawk jargon, the Mohegan jargon, all the Iroquois jargon of trade and learned and sat with their councils and, and studied and like, wow, these people had equality, men and women. Mm -hmm. And they said, how can, and at that time there were f a few million. It wasn't just a hundred thousand or so. There were millions of native people across this land that lived the same way, the same principles. So it was not just the Iroquois, mm -hmm. but the Constitution was in this part in Philadelphia in, in the Northeast, so mm -hmm. so that's where they talk about. In fact, Jake Swamp and Tom Porter, who are traditional chiefs this day of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, um, have those stories that are not written into history books. They may be referenced, mm -hmm. but when the Iroquois chiefs were asked to come to the Freedom Hall, Independence Hall mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, they were put upstairs. And whenever the, the, the Continental Congress had deliberations, they would go upstairs and ask the Native people, what did you do when you got to this part? Mm. And the thing that we don't hear is that these chiefs were locked into the upstairs. They were only brought food and, and questions. And we don't hear the other part of, you know, how the, the founding fathers actually excluded the Native people. Well, that's a mindset because mm -hmm. this country needed an enemy. Mm -hmm. And the women and children, well, they were property of the rich white males, and they couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. And the black man was property also, so they mm -hmm. couldn't vote. Women belonged 
uh, poor white people belonged as serfs or serfdom in that, in that thinking of it. Mm -hmm. And they were proper. They couldn't vote. They didn't have power. Okay. But then you had millions upon millions of native people. Let's not let them vote. Let's not let them vote because that means they're going to be power here. So mm -hmm. from that time, we were mentioned as far as governing, being governed by commerce and that the United States did have say in what they traded with other countries and whatnot. And that's and in the Constitution. And with the Indian tribes, yes. right. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. they, they mentioned Indian nations within. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. And today that's still true. But as far as giving us freedom of religion, um, communal property, which we were used to sharing, that did not fit privatization and ownership, and monarchy especially, mm -hmm. because as you see, this country still adores the king and queen of England, mm -hmm. yet it's a country that's not supposed to be uh, upon those principles where everybody is inalienable and is treated equally. Well, mm -hmm. it's not true with Native peoples even today. Uh -huh. um, it, it's, it's, uh, when, when you are an evidence, living evidence of that constitution and the crimes committed against Native people such as myself and knowing that, and be, be, being able to understand the inequalities, well, that's not going to be listened to because that's the enemy talking to mm -hmm. them. So for, for your 12-year-old, mm -hmm. I say, you know, look at what you're reaping as an American. And you really think in its ownership terms, you think about all Americans, any American, foreigners who come here want a piece of the American pie. Metaphorically, I say, if you want a piece of the American pie, just don't forget who owns the bakery. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.